In 1957, West Coast Automotive Testing Corporation built a road course just 50 miles outside of Los Angeles, California, called Riverside International Motor Raceway. The track was initially planned to be five miles long, an absolute behemoth of a racetrack. However, the final layout was a nine-turn road course that was 3.3 miles long, as the club addition would never be added in. To accommodate NASCAR in the following years, the inner loop that incorporated Turn 7 would be skipped during races, similar to how NASCAR has shortened Sonoma Raceway in the past. Today, we are looking at the track's dark history and a close look into the multiple tragedies that took place in NASCAR. This is NASCAR's most dangerous road course, Riverside International Raceway. Just in the track's first ever race weekend, tragedy struck. The grand opening weekend took place in September of 1957. A sports car club event was one of many slated races, and driver John Lawrence, former World War II veteran, lost his life after rolling his car. It is noteworthy that roll bars were required in the car, but John's car was lacking one of these. This has been speculated to be his cause of death, so maybe the track wasn't to blame. It was the next race weekend that the track hosted that local driver Dan Gurney would catch the eye of a Ferrari scout, which boosted him into European racing. Just a handful of years later, he was a consistent driver in Formula One. However, he would be sure to make an appearance at his local track for nearly a decade, winning at Riverside five different times in NASCAR. NASCAR's journey at Riverside began the next year in 1958. Not much is on record about this race, but a live audience of just 4,000 people attended the grueling 500-mile race. I say grueling because this race was over 6 hours long. Maybe 190 laps on a 2.6 mile road course was not the best idea. Leader Parnelli Jones crashed on lap 147 after leading every lap up to that point, handing the win to Eddie Gray. The track wouldn't make an appearance on the schedule again until 3 years later in 1961, with the race distance shortened to just 100 miles. The track would soon be a staple of the NASCAR calendar, as it would host a race every single year from 1963 to 1988. The narrow track and high speeds made the track hard to master for any stock car driver. The 1963 Riverside 500 marked a new era of the track. The hype for the event was evident as a crowd of over 52,000 made their way to the track. However, the first tragedy of the Speedway would happen just the next year. The 1964 Motor Trend 400 was just the fifth race of the scheduled 62 races in the 1964 season. Ned Jarrett, Richard Petty, and Fireball Roberts had all tasted victory lane. Wendell Scott, although not official at the time, became the first African American driver to win a NASCAR race just a couple of races earlier. The cars were faster than ever before on an already fast course, a road course super speedway of sorts. All of these wrecks you've been watching happened in practice for the Motor Trend 500, including Ken Miles flipping his car. Ken Miles, although not in NASCAR, would lose his life at this very track just two years later. Now, let's head to race day. Fred Lorenzen was on the pole, with Richard Petty starting alongside him. This race was treacherous. I mean, on lap 15, Clem Proctor had a nasty flip. He was a local driver in which most of his starts were at this track. Although he survived this wreck, the next driver would not be as lucky. Just around halfway through the race, Joe Weatherly lost control of his car and hit the outside wall of turn 6. It was at the end of the long, grueling S's, one of the fastest parts of the track. Unfortunately, he was pronounced dead at the scene. It is reported that either his brakes failed or the accelerator stuck. At the time, certain safety elements were not required, they were instead just recommended. Many drivers did not use certain safety features because of many reasons, including comfort, claims that they restricted driving abilities, and some drivers just plain out did not want to use them. However, the biggest reason drivers didn't utilize safety features was because of fires. I mean, we saw a prime example of this just this year at Talladega with Jordan Anderson. Fire is still a big threat to drivers to this day. Joe cited this as the reason that he didn't use certain safety features. With nothing to stop his head from moving or keeping it from leaving the car, his head struck the wall at the time of his impact, taking his life instantly. Joe was a fan favorite driver at the time and two-time defending champion. The Hall of Fame driver was just 41 years old. 
Dan Gurney would claim his second of five Riverside victories that day. However, Joe's car owner Bud Moore considered leaving NASCAR after this incident as it hit him really hard. He would slow down in his efforts in NASCAR over the next couple seasons before returning to full-time racing. The next year in 1965 was not any better for the track. The great A.J. Foyt nearly lost his life in this horrific crash. His brakes failed and he turned hard to the right to avoid fellow driver Junior Johnson. When medics arrived, his skin was blue and he wasn't breathing. The medics rushed and scooped mud out of his mouth, allowing him to breathe again. He was then transported to a local hospital and of course survived. Earlier in the same race, lap one to be exact, Charles Powell, driving his number 38 Pontiac, spun off of the track between turns one and two. A group of spectators were reportedly standing on a forklift in the same place as the wreck and moved closer to see the spinning car. The forklift then lost its balance, likely due to the shifting weight of people jumping off of it, and slid down an incline, which caused a freak accident. The forklift ended up rolling over and landing into a different group of spectators. This injured dozens, seriously injured five, and took the life of one man, Ronald Pickle. Ron is one of two spectators to lose their life at a NASCAR race. Further, after the conclusion of the race, a fan leaving the track on a motorcycle collided with a sheriff deputy, also on a bike, claiming the life of the fan. This was one of the most tragic days for spectators in the sport. After more close calls in the years to come, 1967 would be another dark one for the racetrack. Billy Foster, a young Canadian, was attempting his second ever start in the Grand National Series. He finished 7th place in his only previous start, also coming at Riverside. He clinched a ninth place starting position in qualifying, locking himself into the race. However, he took his dodge for one final practice run before the big show. At the end of the mile-long backstretch, the fastest point of the track, his brakes failed. He tried to ride the wall to soften his impact, but he was traveling way too fast. He initially impacted the wall at 140 miles per hour, shredding the sheet metal off the left side of the car, which is the driver's side. Foster was an avid open-wheel driver, starting 27 times in USAC and finished in the top 10 9 times. He was definitely no slouch behind the wheel. However, there was nothing even the best of drivers could do to stop this incident. The Speedway had claimed its third victim in just four years. The race had multiple incidents as well. According to the NASCAR Flips List Project, the track is sided with 11 official flips in the Grand National Series. Now, this is luckily the last of fatalities at the track. However, in 1987, there was a terrible wreck on Pitt Road. Just seven laps into the race, Herschel McGriff blew an engine to bring out the first caution of the day. Pitt stops then followed. While Bill Elliott's crew was servicing the car, Michael Waltrip and Jim Robinson made contact on Pitt Road. Waltrip's car slid into Elliott's car, knocking it off the jack and injuring three Pitt crew members. Of those that were injured, the most seriously injured was Chuck Hill, who spent weeks in the intensive care unit and suffered a dislocated leg, a fractured hip, and had his spleen removed. Unfortunately, just three years later, Chuck's replacement on the team, Mike Rich, was fatally injured in a pit road incident in Atlanta. The raceway, in its totality across all series, claimed the lives of one pit crew member, one fan, and 19 drivers. Riverside, for a time, was definitely NASCAR's most dangerous road course. Anyways guys, that's it for this video. Make sure you leave a like if you did enjoy, and make sure you subscribe if you haven't already. Anyways guys, thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.